Gadgets are what they really are. They're gadgets, but these are these are gauges that you can use if you're just, uh, you know, a weekend warrior. You know, when you're charcoal cooking, you know, it, it's a it's a labor of love. It's not a situation where you should be saying to myself, I, I, listen, I have to get dinner on the table. It's Saturday. And Saturday, if you start early enough, you have all day to play around. You know, you can jump in the pool, you can come back out and you can play around. So for me, charcoal is a labor of love. I'm Mary Mammoliti. And I'm Jenny Arena. And we're Bits and Bites. It's that time of year. The smoky scent of barbecue fills the air. Whether you're a novice griller or a grill master, there's always an opportunity to learn more. We're getting all your Q&A's answers, starting with equipment to grilling techniques. There was so much information that we decided to create two episodes. Get ready for part one of all up in my grill with the grill master himself, Chef Rob Rainford. So we're going to get started with some of the technical aspects of uh, grilling. And, you know, we just wanted to know what should we be looking for uh, when buying a barbecue? It's barbecue season now, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about it. Um, So what should we be looking for? I I like to tell people that it it really boils down to how much do you want to spend? Um, and are you willing to make the investment to buy something a little bit more sturdy that's going to last you many seasons as opposed to getting that immediate gratification of just going out and purchasing that $200 or $300 grill that'll get you through the season but might not get you through another season? So it's it's always imperative that I tell people, uh, you know, do your research, do your homework, figure out how much grilling are you doing for the season. If you're a once a weeker, then you can go with something a little bit more on the a less expensive side. And then if you're doing it on a regular, like, you know, basically I have a Weber kettle at home right now that I'm using predominantly because I'm doing the charcoal thing over the last uh, year and a half. Um, just go out and buy yourself something really good, heavy gauged, uh, you know, and again, if you're doing the propane or the natural gas, whatever, buy heavy gauge uh, grills that are, are, are grates that are really heavy, and, and the BTU output is probably the most important aspect of finding the grill that's going to work for you. Okay. And you mentioned gas and charcoal. So we have gas, we have charcoal. What are the pros and cons of each? Natural gas and propane, it's the ease of lighting it. Uh, natural gas, propane, one beer before you can start grilling. <laughs> charcoal, between three to four beers before you start cooking. Uh, again, I'm hoping that I'm just giving your 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 audience you know, something that's tangible here that they can work with. I love that analogy. I'm totally going to use that moving forward. <laughs> so we're, we we touched on charcoal, and I know it's it it can be intimidating for people. So can we talk a little bit more about about charcoal and charcoal grilling? For sure, for sure. Amazing. So what is the easiest way to fire up a charcoal grill? I like the chimney starter um, as something that I think everybody can grab from, you know, a Canadian Tire or Home Depot or whatever. Uh, You know, you can buy one of these chimney stars. You put some paper, which is newspaper, which I don't know if many people get anymore, but uh, roll it up in a little uh, circular ball on the bottom. Uh, Use your little lighter, light that with the charcoal sitting on top. It'll just do its natural thing. It'll light uh, your your charcoal for you expeditiously. But here's a a little gadget that I also use at home, which is called a loof lighter, L-O-O-F-T, loof lighter. And you plug it in, you point, it's like a reverse hairdryer and you point it at your coals and you just, and it'll just start sparking on you. And it will light your charcoal in probably two thirds of the time faster than it would if you were to use a chimney starter. But, you know, when you're when you're charcoal cooking, you know, it, it's a it's a labor of love. It's not a situation where you should be saying to myself, I, listen, I have to get dinner on the table. It's Saturday. OK. And Saturday, if you start early enough, you have all day to play around. You know, you can jump in the pool, you can come back out and you can play around. So for me, charcoal is a labor of love. Uh, I use my chimney starter and with one full chimney start you can get a full cook out of it in terms of if you're cooking for a family of four, you could grill some steaks. Um, you could grill chicken on there, even fish. Um, now, if you're going to do like a Boston bud, like you're trying to do pulled pork, now you're going to have to, you're going to have to rearrange it and sort of do a circular burn, but you can also reload as you need. 
the way you explain starting the barbecue, doing the charcoal, it's so calming, so soothing. I think I've been scarred because as a kid, it was always like they're dousing it with fly lighter fluid and everyone's stand back and you're waiting for this fire to happen. Um, and, and I love the way you describe it because I think that scarred me as a kid. It's like so anxiety inducing. It, no, it, it can be. Now, listen, I uh, moved homes eight years ago and I lost a lot of stuff that it was in the storage unit. I don't know where it went. So I ended up using egg cartons and, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, we call it in our house to, to, to the deuce, but the inside of your... Uh, I knew exactly uh, what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> your paper towel, all right? And the inside, you know, cardboard. If you lay those down like, uh, you know, uh, like matchsticks and put some paper in there, you can light that and put your charcoal on top. It, it also acts as, as, as a starter. Uh, and again, the reason I call it tip to the do is because, you know, we used to buy the kids all these gifts and then they would end up playing with the toilet paper roll. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very <laughs> familiar. <laughs> Even our kitty cat now plays with the tip to the do. <laughs> <laughs> What's going Love it. Love it. <laughs> okay. So we've, we've, we've started the grill. We've got the charcoal going. How, how long do you have to let it burn before you can actually start uh, putting your, your food on the grill for cooking? All right. I will say this very slowly because, uh, you know, it might be misinterpreted or misconstrued. Uh, you have to wait for a thick white ash. <laughs> Did I say ash yeah. properly? <laughs> 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 so, so, thick white ash, then you can start cooking. OK, uh, you must you must do that because, it, you know, a lot of people light it they, and you see black. That's not a good thing because the smoke and the flame that's coming off of that is acrid. If it's gray, then it's perfectly amenable to putting your meat on your grill. And I always like to tell people with charcoal cooking, you've got to give yourself zones, just like with your gas barbecue, where you will light one on high, the other one on medium. And if you have three zones, then you have one on maybe off. If you only have two zones, one on high, one on very, very low. So you can mark your meats or your chicken or your proteins or your veg and then shunt them off to the slower side where they can. Now you can close your lid and you can get a good cook in there. Or if you have a bun rack, which most uh, barbecues have bun racks, put your food up there because now you've got yourself at least eight inches away from the heated surface. So you've got a two tiered heat approach. Okay. And how much cooking time would you say you get with, uh, with charcoal once you've, you know, once you've made that, uh, that effort to get, to get the charcoal grill going? A full chimney will give you about an hour, hour and a half worth of cook. Now, remember charcoal starts off high, works itself down low. Um, so again, if it's just a family of four, you don't need all, you don't need a raging inferno. <laughs> you know what I mean? And raging infernos are not really good for barbecuing anyway. You know, um, so it's, it's it's about mastering or about controlling the heat. If you've got something that needs to to cook over a longer period of time, so you have that chicken breast and you don't want it, um, how should we say uh, this in France, say um, uh, shoe leather. <laughs> you, yeah, I was you, just going to say, like the soles of our <laughs> shoes. Yeah, yeah, you just <laughs> move it over to the side, get the grill marks, move it off to the side, close the lid. And then again, chicken breast should take you no longer than 20 minutes from start to finish on the, the low side. Once we've grilled and we have the ash sort of left over from the coals, how do, how do we properly dispose of that? What I like to do is I, I have a little metal bucket that I bought. You can just leave your coals in there. Um, what I usually do, because I'm using generally only charcoal right now, just let it burn out. All right, close, the, close your vents. Remember, if you starve it of oxygen, you will not have to worry about any, you know, burning going on afterwards. And your and your grill is pretty much pretty safe because it's away from the house, you know. And then once I, I do my second cook, I'll just come out, do a little, you know, clean again and move on. I like to clean my grates before I, I finish as well. But if I don't, because sometimes I get lazy, I cook, I eat, I feel like <laughs> not, you know, cleaning. I'm yes. Trouble. Yeah. So I just, you know, I, the next burn I go out, I light my charcoal, I'll put my grates on as everything is heating up. I'll come and give it a great scrape and then move on again. Now let's talk about the five must-haves of grilling tools, gadgets for this summer. 
Oh, there's a lot of stuff. I, again, move away from the metal brushes. Uh, there are different composites now for brushes because last year I did a CBC piece where um, they wanted my expertise on um, how many metal bristles have you ingested? And I said, none, because mm. I, I look at the food before I put it in my mouth. But um, <laughs> make sure that, you know, because your, your bristles do degrade over a period of time. So I would change my brush every season period like it's not something that you want to keep as a family heirloom um so if you, if you get brushes that are different composites better for you even the the scrubbies like they're they look like little bricks and they kind of not like almost like an sos pad and yeah. you can clean you can clean that way uh that's a must have for me um insta read thermometers uh there's ones that you can now point and shoot and they literally will tell you what the temperature of your steak is there's internal probes that you can use as well uh so and again uh, this is for I, I you know i know i'm not speaking to the aficionados uh all the time so uh if you have an internal probe and you have the gauge outside it'll tell you it'll beep at you you can even set it to your watch if you have a, a smart watch uh, Apple Watch. I don't know what it is. I have one, but it's just yeah, on my wrist. Yeah, we bought the iGrill a few years ago. Yes, yes. Love yes. it. And it'll tell you. 125, between 125 and 130 is medium rare. Um, that's perfect steak for me personally. Now, I understand there are people out there that uh, like to kill their meat twice. <laughs> uh, go ahead and have it. <laughs> you can have it. Well done. That's okay. I am raising my hand <laughs> right now. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. It is, it is not 1930 anymore. You, uh, it's, you know, the 50s are over. <laughs> we know the source. We know as Once we know the source, we're really good on that part. Um, again, so Insta Reads thermometers are great. What I like to do is like a drip pants. I, I know a lot of people don't use them, but if you want to save your barbecue uh, from all of the flare ups that happen from time to time, I would always recommend that you get those little lasagna um, foil, I guess, aluminum foil uh, trays or that you can put a lasagna in it. So put it underneath your grill. Believe me, you put your meat on top of that, all the fat that drips into it, you don't have to worry about. You can just take it out, and throw it away at the end. Um, because a lot of people do not clean their barbecues well after each cook. Uh, so it's it's kind of uh, one of those little tricks that I use. Um, spray spray bottles. Always have a spray bottle beside you. So if you get a flare up, you douse it with a little bit of water and you're laughing. You know, you can have two spray bottles, one that you have with apple juice and a little bit of vinegar and water to spritz to, to sort of uh, in, advance that moisture envi moisturized environment. Uh, that's one a beautiful thing to have. And then one for just water to out those flames that come up from time to time. And then maybe one with some Aperol spritz in it. You could spritz it in your mouth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I always have, a, I always have a, a cold one beside you. I don't care what it is. I always have a... That's imperative when you're grilling outside. I would say so for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, and my my thing too with, uh, you know, with gadgets, uh, gadgets are what they really are. They're gadgets. Like there's really, realistically, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at feeling a steak, you know, if I have a relaxed palm and I feel the, the, my heel and it's really spongy, that's rare. Lift my index finger up to my thumb, that's medium rare. The bad finger that you pointed a lot of people, I know both of you have done this before, and that's that's Never. that's medium. I'm I, you know, I have a wet I have a wedding ring and and my wife hates when I use this joke, but the suffering yeah, that's medium <laughs> well. <laughs> and then put your pinky up to your thumb, that's and that tight feeling, that's well done. That's shoe leather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, it is what it is. It is what it is. But these are these are gauges that you can use if you're just, uh, you know, a weekend warrior. Jenny, what did you learn today? Okay, what did I learn from today's episode? That do 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 is universal. <laughs> yes, that paper towel roll, uh, trumpet playing seems to be something that we all recognize. And uh, great tip from Rob to get your fire going. I learned that a meat thermometer gun is out there. I had no idea. I thought it was just by probe. So I want to get myself a meat thermometer gun. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to Bits and Bytes on your favorite podcast player and leave us a review and star rating. We'd like to thank our editor, Matt Agnew, and remind you to take a little time to chew, chat, and chuckle. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>